Hello everybody, welcome to another Viva, it's week 20, I'm extremely tired, as you can see, and I'm, I'm gonna stay up all night today, because I really want to get all my homework done, because I work, and I don't have time, so well, that's what we're gonna do, um, and we're gonna be answering the question today, in what ways did the legacy of World War II play out in the years following the final conclusions of the conflict. Um, we often see the legacy of World War II as as good. We see a good a good war that we fought and we won. But its legacy is a lot more complex and multifaceted. Um, and in the years following the war the, there was a, there was <coughs> sorry there was a strange fog that left people in the ruins of the old Europe and the old world that they once knew and they were left to rebuild so um, we can see the legacy of World War 3 in three ways we can see that it changed people's perceptions of good and evil. Um, secondly, it created a post-world war that looked a lot like America in a lot of ways. And then third, it left scar on the psyches of the soldiers who fought in it. So we're kind of continuing from last week's Viva to see what happened post-world war how did this war change the world which it most certainly did in so many ways um starting with the fact that it changed people's perceptions of good and evil so what happens in the war we have the holocaust we have fire bombings and we have nuclear war these three things um changed how people perceive good and evil and in World War II, for the first time ever, war becomes industrialized. The thing that we can learn from this war is that people who knew how to harness the power of industrialization and the new technologies that were around had the upper hand in war. And as Winston Churchill, most quotable man ever, says, combat has been reduced to the, a business like the stockyards of Chicago. If you don't know, um, Chicago's long legacy is as the Starkyard capital of America, kind of. In a lot of ways, it was known for its butchering and its, like, it was kind of the meat city. No, it, yeah, kind of. A lot of butchering going on in Chicago. And this comparison that Winston Churchill makes um, kind of shows the correlation that war and industrialization have and how the World War II in a lot of ways was a war based on industrialization. Death camps are one example of this. The methods that were used in the Nazi internment camps were a lot like the the methods you would use in a butchering and slaughterhouse, right? Um, you need to keep a bunch of livestock, in this case people, and you need to kill them in the fastest, most efficient way possible, which is what the Nazis terribly and cruelly did to humans during the Holocaust. So. There was a really rapid um, turn of events following the war, or at the end of the war, I should say, nearing the end in like 1945-ish, um, when in January, all in the span of like nine months, this all happens. Okay, so you're ready for a little timeline. January 27th, we have the discovery of Auschwitz. Um, by the Allied troops. Then May 7th, German surrender, Ger Germany surrenders. 
August 6th, oh, that's bitter coffee, wow. August 6th, um, attack on Hiroshima, the first nuclear bomb is dropped. August 9th, the attack on Nagasaki. Um, and then uh, September 2nd, the Japanese surrender. All these events, the, the firebombing, the nuclear war, and the discovery of the Holocaust really made people take a step back and say, whoa, what what happened? What what did this war do to us? And we have a little funny anecdote, aside from the, the darkness of this war, about P.J. Woodhouse, who was a British humorist and author. Now, Woodhouse lived in France in the villa with his wife, who he he had the nickname Plummy for, and they lived together in France. And when the Germans came, they took their time at leaving France. They're like, it'll be fine. We'll get out of here eventually. Until it was too late. And um, they actually like saw the British, not the British, the German troops. And Woodhouse said, um, Plummy, the German army are in our backyard to his wife who like I said before he called Plummy and so because they're British and they're like British nationalists I'm pretty sure they are taken by the German soldiers and taken to an internment camp and at this point um Woodhouse asked one of the guarded gu the guards he's on the train he's like excuse me sir I'm not gonna try a British accent because no, just not. Um, but he asks him, like, where are we? And the guard says, like, well, we are in Silesia. We're in Upper Silesia. And Woodhouse, being the British Brit and the humorous that he is, responds to this, well, if this is Upper Silesia, what on earth must Lower Silesia be like? Um, we can kind of see his humor there, obviously. I'm pointing out the obvious here, but whatever, I'm tired. You give me a break. Um, so the guard, guards at his internment camp are kind of fans of him. They take a liking to him and they actually give Woodhouse a typewriter to write stories for them on. And he doesn't really want this special treatment. He's like, no, leave me alone. They want to, like, give him special quarters, a private house. But he's like, no, I'm in this internment camp. I'm going to, like, suffer along with the other people in here. And because of this, the Germans like him even more. And they actually take him out of the internment camp. He is released and moved by the Germans to Berlin, where he is kind of used for propaganda. They make him do radio like announcements and stuff that, that tell people how well the British are treating him, the Germans are treating him and just kind of like um, show him as an example of like, we're nice to our prisoners, which, come on, come on. <laughs> um, but sadly, um, in 1944, People do an investigation into Woodhouse and they consider him to be a traitor to Britain because he's in Berlin, he's doing like radio announcements and stuff. But um, so they consider him to be a traitor and he could never return home to England for fear of having to be prosecuted for, for being considered a traitor, which is really sad. But in Woodhouse's story, we can see um, one of the effects of the Nazi regime, not necessarily um, as horrific as one of the stories of a Holocaust survivor, um, but it, it does show how the Nazis party still had control over lives um, and they could take people's lives and actual lives away. Um, so let's talk a little bit about firebombing. So firebombs were basically bombs 
that caused fires that were dropped on civilians and like cities to kind of suffocate people kind of I should say to suffocate people not kind of because they did and they were dropped and they kill a ton of people and this kind of changes the game for warfare because before this it for the most part, wars try to be between soldiers, not involving civilians. But in firebombing, civilians were, were actually targeted, which is kind of sad. Um, but techniques from industrialization, as we can see, made war so efficient and had a capacity to destroy humanity more than ever before and we can see this in the firebombing you can just drop a bomb destroy a city kind of thing or like set fire to a city yeah and then we have the holocaust which was an industrialized killing mechanism and also nuclear bombs which it's crazy how much power nuclear bombs have um and, and they all started in World War II, obviously. And all of this together comes comes together in a little beautiful, terrible ball of evil and changes people's perception of what evil is. And the first way we can see a change in perception is through the Nazi party being seen as an image for evil. And then secondly, we see that war began to be seen as evil and not used as a tool for foreign policy as it had been seen in, in the past. Karl von Clausewitz, um, who's a general, I want to say he's from Germany or France, but he says that war is not an independent phenomenon, but the continuation of politics by different means with nuclear weapons, with the mass um, methods of destruction that come about in World War II, war can no longer be a means of foreign, of, like, politics. It just doesn't work. We don't want to destroy humankind because of politics. Industrial efficiency makes war way too easy, and it makes evil too easy. The Soviets killed or are responsible for the deaths of 20 million people, and the Nazis are responsible for the death of 17 million people. These are such huge numbers of people just slaughtered and obliterated using techniques of industrialization kind of that make evil easy in a lot of ways and and then the third perception change between good and evil oh, i'm making no sense but is the banality of evil this comes from the philosopher hannah arendt who believes that and bases her philosophy on the idea that evil is a part of the human condition and in a lot of ways we are all capable of evil and so evil is banal or in or ordinary and Arendt says that quote the sad truth is that m most evil is done by people who never make up their minds between minds to be good or evil, end quote. So we can see her philosophy of saying that all people are capable of evil. There is no, there is no clear evil, terrible person and good person. And in Aaron's theory, it also is applied to mean that evil is can be corrected or educated. Because in her theory, 
Evil is the absence of education, and so it's solvable through education. But nuclear war, however, makes evil in no ways um, banal. So all these three things change people's perception of evil. We see the Nazis becoming the symbol of evil and war being seen as evil rather than a means of foreign policy and then we also see the the banality of evil um on to our second point i'll try to go a little faster i'm sorry i'm kind of losing my speed here when a competitor wins the losers have to imitate the competitor and we can see this post-world war as the losers in this case germany and japan tried to imitate the winners and the new germany and japan are made in a lot of ways in the image of america following the war these two cities um or countries japan and germany were left in ruins completely shattered economies um they're the losers of the war, so they're not doing too hot. And so the allies have to figure out how are we going to rebuild these completely destroyed societies. And they decide and are very influenced to build in according to Western um, liberal democratic ideals. And so that's what they do. They rebuild Germany and Japan in this way. And Germany and Japan imitate American-ness or like make themselves in the image of America in part mostly because of the Marshall Plan, which was a an aid packet that doesn't sound right, but you know what I mean. Um, an idea thought out by G General Marshall, who knew that Europe needed rebuilding. And so he says, hey, we need to rebuild Europe. Let's give them a bunch of money. They give about $13 billion to a lot of the countries in Europe who are suffering. And they buy peace in a lot of ways. They make a lot of people that hate America to love America because of this plan. And they also shield the rest of Europe from communism by showing Europe how great capitalism is and giving them a bunch of money. Really smart and well played on America's part. And with this Marshall Plan, Free trade, um, democracy, and industrialization are are made like ways of, of life for, for everyone, not just America. And the American the countries that America helped grew a lot economically after the aid they received and became richer. Which is really interesting so Marshall Plan made people want to build their countries after America because it made them love America in a lot of ways so that's the second thing we see is that um, in a lot of ways the countries were built after America in the image of America and then thirdly we're gonna see that the war left a scar on the psyches of its participants a lot of them suffered from PTSD and they dealt with their pain through um, silence, alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, and some of them joined cults. We're mostly going to focusing on, be focusing in on the cult thing. So to dull the edges of all this bad, t horrific, that's the word I was looking for, horrific, not horrible, horrific. All these horrific things that they had seen, a lot of the soldiers that came back turned to alcohol, 
cigarettes and drugs to numb this pain that they felt. We see a rise in all these mental health issues and then PTSD is also really common. The book by Patricia, Patricia, Patricia Heisman, Strangers on a Train, captures this kind of weird post-war America. And this is a short story, a short um, psycho, like, psychotic thriller, not psychotic thriller. But this is a psychological thriller. That's the word, not psychotic. But it's a little psychotic. Uh, it's a psychological thriller that, that, that has these themes of evil and good, um interacting and show this psychological distress in a lot of ways that was kind of a theme in the era following the second world war now let's get to what y'all are really here for just kidding the cult of scientology which was the first american cult actually since mormonism and it formed out of World War II. It was so influenced by the war that the ideas and mythology behind it even mirror in a lot of ways what happened in World War II. The mythology behind Scientology is that there was a big nuclear war in space that, that destroyed and killed all these people and the ghosts and the remnants from that war haunt people today and give them all the problems that they have. So it's not our problems that we're dealing with. We have taken on the problems of a ghost, which in a lot of ways is kind of dope. And the ghosts are kind of like glued to us. And yeah, we can all kind of get back to our problems through this ghost and dealing with his or her issues. And another way that it kind of very particularly connects to World War II is its relation to the military, the priests hood of Scientology wear naval uniforms and call themselves Sea Org. So yeah, that's the cult of Scientology. We see it as a reaction to the the scar and the left on the psyche of participants in the war. Did that make sense? Now that I'm thinking about it again, maybe not. But my main idea is here. My main idea is that the legacy of the world, of the world, the second world war, is that firstly it changed our perception of good and evil, it shaped the world and the losers of the war in America's image, and it left a scar in the psyches of the soldiers who fought in it. Wow, at that exact moment, the lights outside my house turned out. Okay, well, with that, I close. Sorry if this was long-winded. I really tried, and I really just need to get this out because I have so much homework to do, I can't even begin to describe it. So... Have a good week. I don't know what week it is. I'm just trying to get through it. So, anyway, bye. <laughs>